It's very interesting, you know, um, the story of Emperor Norton that has sort of come down to us, the sort of received uh, version, uh, does talk about his proclamation, and he's sort of known as, as being someone who wrote these proclamations, uh, but very few of them actually get discussed. Um, there are, by my uh, educated guess, probably some 400 of these that are done, that were done uh, during his lifetime, uh, but the accounts that you read uh, sort of online and in books generally focus on maybe a half a dozen, you know, and, and, and the, way, the way the story sort of came down uh, in, the, in the 1920s and 30s, uh, it was a period of, of uh, the sort of the forging of the, of, the, of the Emperor Norton myth that we sort of know about. Uh, and, and a lot of the, the people who were writing as historians uh, during that time were really functioning more as folklorists, um, and they weren't necessarily very uh, sanguine or savvy about how actually uh, the media was treating uh, Emperor Norton and how, and how very often uh, during his lifetime uh, editors would, would write uh, sort of prank proclamations, hoax proclamations, which were not his at all. Uh, and it wasn't really until, until the mid-'80s uh, there was a book uh, by William Drury uh, called Norton the First, which still is sort of recognized as the authoritative biography, where he really started to kind of drill down and kind of look at some of this stuff and, and try to sort of think through, uh, you know, which ones are, are probably his and which ones really aren't. Um, it turns out that, that in the 1860s, there, there was sort of an initial period after Emperor Norton declares himself, uh, Josh Norton declares himself emperor in, in September of 1859, there was an initial period for about three years where uh, his proclamations are being published in the Evening Bulletin, which was where, uh, which is where the original proclamation was published, uh, and that's where you get the proclamation, um, um, you know, abolishing Congress and and abolishing the Democratic and Republican parties. You know, these kind of very sort of dramatic proclamations get a lot of, a lot of attention, and then after a couple of years, you know, the joke kind of. It wears a little thin, and the bulletin is not really interested in, in that anymore. Uh, there's a paper called the Daily All to California, which was another sort of leading paper of, of San Francisco at the time. And, and the editor there, a gentleman named uh, Albert Evans, uh, he thought it would just be hilarious to write all these proclamations you know, in the emperor's uh, name uh, that were not his uh, at all. And at a certain point, the emperor gets tired of this, and he forged a relationship with uh, a paper called the Pacific Appeal. The Pacific Appeal uh, was an African-American-owned uh, and operated uh, abolitionist weekly. And, and he basically sort of went to them and said, you know, hey, if you'll, if you'll sort of write, uh, publish only what I say and, and not uh, what you think I said or should say, uh, then we'll have, have an arrangement. And it really is during that period, uh, from December of 1870 uh, through uh, May of 1875, uh, that is the emperor's really sort of most most prolific sort of proclamation delivering period, uh, but these proclamations almost never get talked about. Uh, and so that's going to be the focus of, uh, of our uh, discussion this evening, which is really more about, uh, it's more show than tell, uh, and that's just because, uh, you know, these things sort of never ever get seen, uh, and so just to kind of get them circulated and kind of in the public uh, atmosphere is, is a good is a good and helpful thing. So, uh, so we're going to have a run at, at about 50 of these, uh, and we're just going to go very quickly, just kind of clip through them and, and not have a whole lot of discussion about each one, but just to kind of give you a really good illustration of the full range of his thought. Um, you know, because other than those first, those first few about abolishing Congress and et cetera, et cetera, uh, you see the proclamations where in 1872 uh, he sort of set out and popularized the vision for the Bay Bridge. Uh, those proclamations were written uh, in the Pacific Appeal. Uh, you see the stories uh, about how Emperor Norton is supposed to have, have uh, called the word Frisco abominable. That actually uh, seems not to be uh, accurate at all. <laughs> it seems to be just a, a totally apocryphal tale uh, and doesn't have any documentation at all. Um, you know, but, but the ones where, where he really is uh, sort of... Um, making himself into a real early champion of the, the spirit of, of, of tolerance and fairness uh, and the common good and self-determination that came to be the symbol of San Francisco, uh, this is the paper where he's writing them. And so we're going to look at, at some of these proclamations, and you'll see uh, exactly why uh, he has that uh, reputation and kind of why we've been uh, focusing on sort of that aspect in this particular uh, bicentennial season. So 
Here is uh, the first one right there. I hope you can see these. I know we were supposed to have a, a somewhat larger screen, but I will read them out. Uh, and uh, this one appeared um, uh, on 7th of January, 1871. Uh, and he writes, being anxious to have a reliable weekly imperial organ, we Norton I de gratia Emperor of the United States, in other words, by the grace of God, Emperor of the United States, and Protector of Mexico, do hereby appoint the Pacific Appeal, our said organ, conditionally, that they are not traitors and stand true to our colors. So this is the context. You know, he's, he's tired of having the papers that are not true to his colors, and he wants one that is. And so, and so he has gone to the editor, Peter Anderson, and says, you know, if, 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 you'll, uh, if, if we understand each other, then we have a deal, and, and, and we'll, keep on, uh, we'll keep on doing this, and you'll have something nice for your front page. And, uh, and, and in this period, between, between 1870 and 1875, uh, there was almost always um, a proclamation every week, and often there were two and three uh, uh, on, on, the same, uh, on the same day. It came on, on Saturdays. Uh, and so here's one uh, that came out on the 15th of March, 1873. Uh, this actually had appeared previously uh, in a magazine called The Torchlight, which was a uh, a Jewish publication. Uh, the emperor was uh, was Jewish uh, originally, and uh, uh, as as some of you may know, he he actually would uh, would attend the the uh, congregation Emmanuel on Saturdays, uh, but then on Sundays he would rotate amongst the other churches. So he was really kind of an ecumenical uh, sort of sort of guy, but he still uh, sort of maintained his roots uh, to the Jewish community. Um, and in this, um, in this proclamation, which he heads up, uh, Mene, Mene, Tekel, You Parson, which is, um, which is from an Old Testament story about uh, the handwriting is on the wall. That's the, sort of the, the basic translation of the phrase. And he says, give us a constitution which will engender good laws and one which will enforce their proper administration and thereby get the Americans eventually a good instead of a bad name. Here's one from 19th September 1874. The authorities of Washington are held responsible and much to blame for their neglect to consolidate the Constitution or frame a new one, abolishing the state constitutions by which neglect the present Southern difficulties have been engendered. Many, many, take all you parson. Same phrase. So the emperor was a, he was a topical guy. He would, um, you know, he lived for most of his reign on Commercial Street between uh, Montgomery and and uh, Kearney. Um, a small uh, boarding house called the Eureka Lodgings. And um, in the mornings, he had a routine where the, the, the lodging house next door, called, actually called the Empire Lodgings, um, had the one thing that his own place didn't have, which was a reading room. And so he would go every morning, and, and you know, next door he would wake up, and he would go read the papers. And so he kept, kept himself a reprise of what the, what the issues of the day were. And so, and so what you have you know, across all these proclamations is really a kind of a policy brief uh, for the Norton government. I mean, he's really sort of talking about you know, what he thinks uh, should happen, uh, both uh, on issues of, of national scale, uh, but also uh, increasingly on issues of sort of local uh, and more uh, topical uh, interest. So here's one from uh, the 2nd of March, 1872. The emperor congratulates the city of San Francisco on the laying of the cornerstone of the new city hall and hopes that the nation will now take a new departure and lay the foundation of honor and justice and thereby ensure a future glory for the Bay City. So all these proclamations, they, ha they have a very... They have a very uh, serious, high, formal tone, and 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 it really is. It's it's one of the ways that it's it seems possible to sort of separate the wheat from the chaff and sort of figure out you know which ones are, are more likely his and which ones aren't. You know, a lot a lot of the ones that were published by other papers uh, in his name were were very jokey, prank, pranky, uh, had lots of uh, uh, slang language. There was one that the, that the Alta published. Uh, there was one of the one of the uh, the rival eccentrics was a guy who who styled himself uh, Stella for the king, and uh, and the Alta you know tries to sort of gin up this this rivalry between the emperor and Stella for the king, and 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 and, and the editor writes uh, you know down with usurpers, down with imposters, and the first line of the proclamation is off with his head. <laughs> You know, and this is just it, it, when you read the other proclamations, it just doesn't seem like the sort of thing that he actually would have said. Uh, you know, mostly they were they were uh, much more uh, sort of formal and uh, circumspect. Uh, here's one 
uh, from the 10th of August, 1872. And you start to get a sense of how, of how modern his concerns uh, still are when you read these things today. Uh, this one uh, is, is a piece about uh, election bribery and political corruption. He writes, understanding that one party is spending money to, bri to bribe voters for the ensuing elections, and also that the opposition party are expending large amounts for the same purpose. And whereas we believe that persons who accept offices under such auspices are totally unfit to make laws which will effectually reward merit and punish a crime, and if they do, by chance, occasionally make good laws, yet they are not the proper persons to enforce them. Now, therefore, we, Norton I, Emperor of the U.S. and Protector of Mexico, do warn the American people against continuing such corrupt parties in power as it will end in their ruin. Seems pretty contemporary, right? Here's one uh, from uh, the 12th of October, 1872. Uh, whereas we are determined that the people of the United States and Mexico shall have a good constitution, and by which party strife shall be obviated, as also one that the laws can be enforced and not biased by party. Now we, Norton the First Day Gratia, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, do hereby, hereby decree that there shall be no further elections for presidents until the nation can have a national convention and frame government by which said difficulty can be properly prevented. In the meantime, the laws of Norton the First can be made use of. <laughs> He's a very generous guy. Here's one from the 21st of November, 1874. Whereas it is necessary to the honor of the American name that an end should be put to bribery and fraud, now therefore we, Norton I, Dei Gratia, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, do hereby decree disenfranchisement and loss of office to any member of Congress and United States Senate who shall, prevent, who shall be proven guilty of, of purchasing votes or using money to obtain his office and further do hereby decree his estates to be confiscated to the empire. <laughs> he's, he's right on the nose, isn't he? Um, but, but again, you know, these proclamations, it's, it's, it's very interesting, you know, that, that he uh, is as legendary as he is, uh, and yet it seems that for so long, uh, you know, these proclamations, which which for me personally are really the meat of what he was about, uh, you know, have not really gotten a lot of attention. So it's, it's, good, to, it's good to sort of see these things and, and see uh, what, he was, what he was really sort of trying to accomplish. Uh, here is one uh, from the 18th of May, 1872. This one gets a little more um, uh, personal. He says, on the 7 o'clock ferry with a passenger for the overland train, a tallish, knavish-looking fellow, representing himself as Mr. Short, Short of, short of honesty, a grain merchant of Chicago who fraudulently, fraudulently got possession of the following document written in pencil. And the document said, San Francisco, May, May 6, 1872, received of Mr. Short 50 cents the amount with interest to be convertible to 7% bonds in 1880 or payable by the agent of our private estate in case the government of Norton the first does not hold firm. In testimony where we have to affix our royal seal and signature Norton the first emperor, uh, to which Emperor Norton responds, any person who will catch the fellow and make him pay something to the poor and return our receipt will do a service to the honor of, of Norton, the first emperor. So his, his idea is that somehow this guy has gotten a hold of one of these, one of these uh, promissory notes, uh, which he started issuing uh, sometime around uh, late 1870, uh, but that hadn't, uh, hadn't paid his money and was, uh, was representing... Uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn, that's, that's a good, good catch. Uh, Brooklyn was actually... Uh, was actually Oakland, uh, basically. Uh, Brooklyn was a township. Uh, it was just it was just to the uh, south uh, east, I think, of Lake Merritt. Uh, neighborhoods now um, sort of Clinton uh, around that sort of area. Um, um, the Brooklyn Basin, you know, the um, uh, Jingle Town, that sort of area is, is and that's where he. Um, uh, in 1872, uh, that area was was annexed to Oakland. So Oakland got about twice as big as it had it had been. Uh, but when the emperor would would go every week by ferry uh, and hang out, uh, whether for day trip or or for you know a couple of other a uh, couple of days uh, if he had a longer stay, uh, that's where he uh, was. In fact. The, uh, the proclamations in 1872, there were three of them where he's sort of setting out the vision for 
uh, what became the Bay Bridge, there is a fourth proclamation in June uh, of that year, uh, datelined Brooklyn, where he is calling for a, a, um, an underwater railroad communication. Trans Bay Tube. So, so there you go. He was on it. Here is one uh, from the 22nd uh, of June, 1872, about stock market fraud. Whereas we are desirous that the Board of Brokers of the Stock Exchange of this city should conduct their business on an honorable and solid basis, and whereas there is a class of individuals who frequently cause the inflation and depression of the market by false representations, thereby gouging those who are uninitiated, and whereas there are companies allowed to put stock on the market through the connivance or, or tacit consent of the Board of Brokers, which possess no title or right to the land on which their mining operations are to be conducted, and some of the said companies having their mines located in the, quote, invisible aisles, thousands of miles away from realization, thereby causing the circulation of a lot of spurious stock, and which will inevitably cause serious loss to a number of unsuspecting persons. Now, therefore, we do hereby command the Board of Brokers to purge their list of stocks of all such fraudulent stock under penalty of ordering the chief of police to close their rooms and the appointment of a new board. So uh, Emperor Norton, the master of the run-on sentence, you know, like all those, all those, those dependent clauses, they just keep coming. <laughs> usually, usually, you know, the, the, the proclamations were, were fairly uh, pithy. This is, this is one of the longer ones. Uh, usually they were, they were very, very short, just like a few. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was, he was not, not happy. It's, uh, it's amazing to think what he would have done with Twitter. You know, this is, this is when he, uh, you know, he, he, uh, you know, he had, he had to limit himself to, to once a week, you know, and, and only had, you know, that much uh, column space. But, uh, uh, so here's one from the 15th of November, 1873. Whereas it is extremely probable that the Supreme Court of the United States will hold that no sale of overflowed lands is good unless under our royal authority and personal seal and signature during our reign as emperor, and whereas it is dangerous precedent to establish the giving away of public lands to private corporations for nothing. Now, therefore, we Norton the first to hereby order Mayor Alvord to veto the bill granting the China Basin to Booth et al. So again, very... Uh, very modernist concerns, and it just show, sort of shows how, how long these concerns have been around, right? Uh, here's one from the uh, 14th of November, uh, 1874. Uh, again, a smaller concern, whereas the use of postage stamps more than once has become too general. Now, therefore, we, Norton the first day, gratia emperor of the U.S. and protector of Mexico, do hereby order the detectives to make diligent search and arrest all and every person guilty of such practice of fraud upon the public treasury. You can only use them once. You can't use them two and three times. That was his problem. That was the, yeah. That was that was that was that was uh, that was thieving the public uh, the public treasury by by uh, sort of getting uh, more value for your stamp than you really should. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, perhaps. Uh, let's see. All right, here's a good one. Uh, 27th May 1871. Whereas we ordered the colored people some years back to be permitted to ride the street railroad cars, but in order to prevent collision and future disturbance, we hereby command the arrest of all who violate that decree um, and then a separate, a separate issue. So he's, this is, um, in 1871 and 1874, uh, now this is 90 years before uh, the advent of the modern civil rights era and the Civil Rights Act, uh, Emperor Norton is, is insisting that African Americans be able to ride public streetcars and attend public schools, uh, as we'll see. Uh, the next one, uh, 7th March uh, 1874, whereas the American nation having acknowledged the citizenship of the colored people, their children are entitled to admission to public schools and all the privileges of citizenship. You must either take this citizenship away and exclude or admit them and grant them their privileges. So either they have the rights or they don't, you know. And so, uh, you know, we had the Emancipation Proclamation and uh, let's, uh, let's keep on moving. Um, here's one uh, from uh, the 26th of April, 1873. 
Uh, and this concerns uh, Native American people, which were, were another uh, uh, sort of source of concern uh, for him. Uh, whereas it is, it is our intention to have publicly punished before as many Indian chiefs as can be assembled together, all the Indian agents and other parties connected with frauds against the Indian tribes and the government, in order to satisfy the Indians at the future, the American people intend acting justly toward them. Now, therefore, we nor in the first day, gratia, emperor of the United States and protector of Mexico, do hereby command the arrest and imprisonment of said parties, and all the chiefs get together whom we intend to be present with a large force. It's, it's very interesting. You know, all these proclamations, you know, you know it's, what, what's hard to know is, is to what extent you know, we should be sort of thinking of, of, of Emperor Norton as a, as a civil rights advocate in the way that we sort of understand that term. Um, you know, because it's, it's worth remembering, you know, that when, when the emperor's writing these things in the 1860s, 1870s, uh, it's a pretty chaotic time in San Francisco and, and, and in the West in general. Uh, and so, you know, I think, you know, for him, you know, a lot of this is just about, you know, what do you have to what is necessary for a well-ordered society, you know? And, and to have a well-ordered society, you gotta be fair to everybody, you know? Uh, so, you know, whether it was necessarily an altruistic civil rights-ish kind of uh, sentiment, it's, it's, it's hard to know, uh, but, but the upshot certainly is, uh, is, is clear. Um, let's see. Next one, uh, this one came out in, uh, on the 7th of June, 1873. There was a, there was a, there was a conflict uh, that summer. Uh, there was a group of, uh, of Native Americans who uh, were occupying some land in Northern California uh, as a, in, in a sort of current day Amador County uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a protest uh, against what, what the government was, was doing uh, to their lands. And so this this uh, this created a, a whole uh, sort of conflict, and there was a there was a leader of, of this of this group of Native Americans who was known as as Captain Jack. And so uh, some of this this next uh, few uh, sort of proclamations kind of deals with uh, what the emperor thought should happen uh, with him and what the uh, what the government should be doing. In this one, he says, "Now that the Modocs are subdued, and that was the that was the tribe." Uh, we are anxious the nation should continue in its determination to civilize and reclaim from barbarism all the natives within its territories. And whereas there is no savage so wild or treacherous, but that can be reclaimed by kindness, and if he believes you are his friend, now therefore we, Norton the first day, gratia emperor of the United States and protector of Mexico, do hereby command that Captain Jack, his braves, and his squaws be placed in charge of Goat Island to guard the interests of the city of San Francisco against the attacks of foreign war vessels. It's interesting, you know. You know, you do you do have uh, this this sort of note of of of, uh, of people who are who need to be civilized, you know. Which you, so you do see that there that there's a sense in which which Emperor Norton still is a is a person of his time. Uh, you know, he's not he's not totally uh, he's not totally outside of, of where he of where he uh, lives. Uh, here's one uh, from the 10th of August, 1873. Uh, whereas the execution of Captain Jack uh, and the other Indians condemned by the court-martial will tend to bring on a, gen a general Indian war, as also have an injurious effect on the prestige of the American government by those not in accord with its best phrase, considering also that the Indian agents have always been on the make and grab, as also of other Indian lands. Now, therefore, we, De Gratia, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, do hereby by prohibit the carrying out of the court martial that our imperial decree in their case be enforced. So they were being brought up for for the death penalty, basically, and which did eventually happen. Um, uh, Emperor Norton just thought that wouldn't do any good, uh, so he was he was advising uh, against uh, the death penalty in this case. Here is a series of proclamations uh, about the Chinese. And uh, of course, in Emperor, in Emperor Norton's day, it really was the Chinese who, who were, in many respects, sort of the lowest on the social uh, strata. They were they were the they were the immigrant they were the immigrants of their day, uh, and uh, and he took up their uh, cause in many uh, proclamations. Here's one from the 24th of August, 1872. Whereas we are desirous of preventing any outrage and wrong against good law-abiding Chinese as also to prevent, to prevent ruinous competition to the other laboring classes and bring also desirous of protecting our commerce and treaties with the gigantic empire of China. Now, therefore, we, Norton I, Emperor of the United States and protector of Mexico, 
do hereby command that a standing committee of both Chinese and other laborers be appointed who shall regulate the powers of labor and endeavor to alleviate any difficulties which might arise on that subject. So, I mean, this was a very, this was a presenting issue, you know, the whole, the whole issue of the, of the Chinese and labor and how do you, how do you deal with that? And of course, you know, uh, it was, it was around this time that you had, you had Dennis Kearney and the, and the, and the, and the Sandlot uh, riots and, and all that stuff, you know, that, that, that Emperor Norton thought was just not, not uh, sort of good for, for, uh, for the country, not good for the community, but, but it also, uh, he understood, uh, was not good for, for labor either. Uh, so, so he had his eye on the, on the big picture uh, of, of, uh, of, what the, uh, of what the consequences might be. Here's one uh, from February 1st, 1873. Uh, Whereas unprincipled demagogues are constantly harping on the injury done to labor by the influx of the Chinese. And whereas we believe that the employment of great n numbers of Chinese is beneficial to labor and giving more work and regular, em regular employment, for even if they have to sacrifice something on a day's labor, it is made up by the increased value of their other interests and the prosperity of the manufacturers of the United States. And whereas we are desirous that our treaties and commercial relationships, relations with that large and influential empire shall be properly respected, know therefore all whom it may concern that the eyes of the emperor will be upon anyone who shall counsel any outrage or wrong on the Chinese." Here's one uh, from the 10th of January, 1874, on the same issue. For the better protection of the health of all of our citizens, we, Norton I, Dei Gratia, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, do hereby order and decree that a separate locality in the several cities respectively be appropriated by the city councils of each city to be termed the Chinese quarters, and that the board of supervisors in the city and county of San Francisco forthwith set apart some separate locality for that object, thereby settling a much vexed question. Of course, you read that, and it's, it's sort of hard not to, you know, the, the word ghetto kind of kind of rises up in your imagination, you know. But but I, in, in my own uh, reading, I think he was just trying to sort of think through, you know, what was the best way to keep these people safe, you know, when you when you have when you have people just sort of willy nilly who are coming on the attack at all hours of the day, um, you know, what's what's the best way to kind of keep them uh, from uh, from being the subjects of that kind of violence? So. Um, so that was one idea that he had to, to try to make things a little better. Here is, uh, here is a piece from the 26th of September, 1874. Uh, to His Celestial Majesty, the Emperor of China, my dear brother, I address you these few lines to the same purport as I did some years ago to your predecessor to request that you will limit as far as possible the immigration of the Chinese, your Majesty's subjects to this country, as I will not be able to restrain a strong feeling against them, which might end in disaster to them if they'd be permitted to come in un an unlimited numbers. So he, you know, he sees, he sees what the trends are, and he sees, uh, uh, again, he's sort of looking to see uh, what might be done to ameliorate the problem. Here is uh, a couple of pieces on, uh, oh, not that one. Let's see. That one was taken uh, between the spring of 1871 and the spring of 1872, a firm called Tuttle and Johnson. And there was a, there was a photographer named Tuttle who, um, who was sort of a peripatetic kind of guy. He had many, many partners over the years, and, and it seems that, uh, that it was only sort of during this particular uh, period between between spring spring of 1871 and 1872, uh, that he had uh, Johnson as a partner, and uh, and so uh, they took that picture. In fact, there they Tuttle was living at the time uh, in a in an apartment building on Kearney Street um, that was also occupied by uh, a guy named Theodore Kirchhoff, uh, who was a German uh, immigrant. Uh, who wrote some of the earliest uh, accounts uh, of the emperor. So it was kind of interesting to uh, speculate as to whether those people might have had any conversations about their, uh, their shared interest. Let me get back to my place here. Let's see. Okay. So religion was a subject of, of a great interest in for Norton. He was, as I said, he was an ecumenical uh, kind of a guy, and he was he was very interested uh, in the idea of a of a universal religion. He was very uh, concerned about the the negative effects of 
of uh, sectarianism, uh, Puritanism, uh, and, and thought that, that a universal religion where people didn't get caught up in these issues of, of doctrine and whatnot was probably a good way to kind of uh, uh, make religion a more unifying uh, force rather than a divisive one. Uh, here's one, uh, 7th of October, 1871, one of the longer ones that will, probably the longest one we'll look at tonight. Uh, whereas there are great commotions in different quarters of the terrestrial globe arising from discussing the question, the purification of the Bible, its true and false lights, and fears are entertained, if the false lights be not expunged, that a war may break out at some remote point and spread all over the whole world, carrying in its winding course death, pestilence, famine, devastation, and ruin. And whereas such a state of affairs is to be deplored by all liberal-minded religionists, who oppose bigotry, charlatanism, humbuggery, fraud, and whereas religion is like a beautiful garden, wherein the false lights may be compared to, to the poppies, which fall to the ground, decay, and are no more. The true lights are like the omniscientes, a new word to me, uh, which bloom in everlasting etherealism, blessing forever the creator and the religious world by their love and truth. Now, therefore, we, Norton I, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, do hereby command that all communities select delegates to a Bible convention to be held in the city of San Francisco, state of California, USA, on the second day of January 1873, for the purpose of eliminating all doubtful and disputed passages uh, uh, contained in the present printed edition of the Bible, and the measures be inaugurated toward the obliteration of all religious sects and the establishment of an universal religion. I, I have to wonder uh, whether the emperor was aware of, of the Jefferson Bible. You know, Thomas Jefferson sort of had his own Bible where he sort of clipped out all the, all the, uh, the supernatural parts and kept it a, a purely sort of naturalistic uh, document. And, and I wonder if something like that is what uh, the emperor had in mind. Um, the other interesting note on this one is this, this came out on the 7th of October, uh, 1871. Uh, the weekend before, the exact same proclamation was printed in the paper uh, with this exception. Uh, the, the word uh, religionists uh, originally was Christians. Kind of interesting that he, uh, that he thought it was necessary to broaden it out and, uh, and, and not limit it, what he was saying, uh, just to Christians, and uh, so much so that the paper was willing to print it a second time. Here is one uh, from uh, the 21st of December, 1872, where it is our, our intention to endeavor to obtain some alteration in the, in the doctrine of the church by which the Hebrew and Christian faith will become united, also by which the, f the foreign churches will become Americanized. Now, therefore, we, Norton the first day, Grati, Emperor of the United States, and Protector of Mexico, do hereby prohibit the enforcement of the Sunday law uh, until our object is obtained and one Sunday established. And, of course, the blue laws, of course, were particularly disadvantageous to uh, the Jewish community who were being kept from uh, working and doing business on, on Sunday. So, so that, was, uh, that was near and dear to his heart. It's also interesting uh, that, you know, at, at that time, even people like the Unitarians uh, who may have been talking in, in these kind of ecumenical terms, they weren't really talking about bringing the Jews into the into the party, it was it was about uniting all the different Christian denominations. But the idea that 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 Christian and Hebrew together should be one uh, one religion was a was a was a pretty new uh, idea that was not very commonly heard uh, at the time. Here's one uh, from the 20th of February, 1875. Religious liberty. Methodist Church North, Methodist Church South. During the war, don't have the Lord's Prayer in the schools. Catholicism and spiritualism, communion of the people. The emperor wants but one church in all his dominions. So, so there you go. Prayer in public schools, not for the emperor. <laughs> Here's one from the 13th of March, uh, 1875. Uh, starts out with a little uh, poem. Uh, Take three little ropes, red, white, and blue, and they will... They will hang Catholic, Protestant, or Jew, but unravel the ropes and weave them, and you have the colors which make a beautiful flag, one that blesses and protects all who live under it. This is an allegory the emperor commends to Reverend Mr. Hammond as a subject to preach to children about instead of slandering God and sowing seeds of bigotry and imbecility in the minds of his little subjects. So, uh, 
Yeah, Amber, Amber Norton was really. I mean, even though he, even though he, um, he always attended the the, the synagogue on, on Saturdays, uh, and he did make his sort of rounds to different churches on Sundays. The Unitarians were really his favorite. He he was he was very he he resonated very much with their whole kind of idea of of the separation of church and state, and 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 that as being sort of a uh, and 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 just in general, they're they're more. Uh, I think humanistic approach uh, to religion was something that that appealed uh, to him. Uh, here is one um, from 27th of uh, April, 1872. So now we're kind of going uh, more into um, uh, modern day for him, uh, sort of policy issues, um, um, entrepreneurship, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this one, uh, whereas it is imperative that the national welfare, that the Central and Union Pacific Railroads be completed with good and solid double tracks, and also that they have strong uh, metallic snowsheds and snow melting apparatuses wherever needed, so that now, so that snow blockades uh, hereafter may be avoided, and it is hereby commanded that the western terminus of Central Railroad be in San Francisco. And that was really, you know, the, the idea that the that the that the Transcontinental Railroad, which which um, in 1869 was sort of ending in Oakland, actually should, should be extended to San Francisco. That was really the animating issue. That was the animating sort of idea behind the whole drive for, uh, for a bridge across the bay because, of course, San Francisco understood uh, that if the, if the railroad ends in Oakland, then that's where the economic powerhouse is, and they're, they're left out in the cold. But if, if the railroad ends here, then, then that preserves uh, San Francisco's position. And, uh, and Amber Norton, uh, he liked that idea. So. Here is one from uh, 28 February 1874. Uh, whereas the railroads of these uh, United States are looked upon as bad, both here and in Europe, just like today. And whereas they will so continue uh, unless the laws of the empire are absolute and unchangeable, and whereas the present Constitution being a failure, we warn both state and Congress against any proceedings whereby this important interest, and in fact the only interest that will have eventually the greatest importance in this country, will be injured or retarded, meaning the railroads. Interesting in this one, he, he signs off, uh, Emperor U.S. and Protector of Mexico, Sandwich Islands and Cape of Good Hope. That's the, that's the only only one that I've ever seen uh, where he's he's taking in the Sandwich Islands and, and Cape of Good Hope under his uh, under his protective uh, umbrella. Uh, yes, indeed. Here's one uh, from uh, 17th of October, 1874. I'm not sure if this is if this is really, if this is really his, but it's but it is it is uh, it does resonate with 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 others that he did uh, that he did uh, write. Uh, but it's written in this kind of dramatic form, uh, titled Pro Bono Publico. Time, 11 a.m., place, California Street. Citizen, why are the sidewalks not, not kept clear, Emperor? Emperor, why don't you apply to the mayor and board of supervisors, whom you have elected to administer their laws justly for redress? Citizen, the fact of the matter is, Emperor, they play and humbug us every time. Emperor, well, if your elected officials are so biased by the electors, how on earth can you expect the emperor to rectify the evil <laughs> except, a law, except a law is passed commanding all officers to have their bonds approved by the emperor and then he will be responsible? <laughs> I love the form of this one. I, I, I don't know if it's real. It's, uh, it's just uh, it's very curious, that, uh, that little dramatic uh, approach. Um, here's one uh, from... Um, 16th December 1871. Um, you know the emperor. Uh, he, he had he had the inventor bug. He he um, you know he he had this this these proclamations about about the Bay Bridge, uh, but he also had a few um, inventions up his sleeve. Uh, some of which he actually got uh, patented. Apparently, uh, here's one. Um, 16th, 16th December 1871. Uh, whereas we have invented a snow melting machine by which pure fresh water can be obtained from the mountains during the winter season. And whereas we observe that it is the intention of the Board of Supervisors of the city and county of San Francisco to increase that water supply of the city, now therefore we, Norton the First, Dei Gratia Emperor, do hereby prohibit the Honorable Board of Supervisors from incurring any further expense, therefore, until the practicability of our scheme shall have been thoroughly tested and thereby their wants can be supplied for an expense of about two or three millions instead of 13 or 15 millions as proposed. 
You know, it, it's uh, it's interesting that that Emperor Norton, uh, you know, one of his regular haunts in the afternoons uh, was the Mechanics Institute, and the Mechanics Institute, of course, was a place where where the celebrated inv inventors and, and and technologists of the day were were always kind of hanging out, uh, photographers and railroad people and all that. Uh, so when you when you see these kind of proclamations, it's uh, it's 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 obvious or why he, he found that a, a sympathetic uh, place for him to, uh, to be hanging out. Uh, he, would, he would meet those people when he was there. He's, um, here's one, uh, 14th of September, uh, 1872. Starts out uh, with a quote uh, from the Mining and Scientific Press, which is a, a, a journal, of the, uh, like a trade journal of, of the day. Emperor Norton has invented a railroad switch, a model of which is now being made. It consists of a novel application of a spiral or elliptic spring operated by the weight of the passing train by which the switch is turned off or on as desired. Patent applied for. And the Emperor's proclamation, the Emperor desires that there should be a thoroughly practical and mechanical switch and his ideas to be improved upon so that Europe will be glad to pay money to America for the patent. Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, and then he's letting them know that the emperor's uh, rendezvous on Friday mornings uh, for the present will be at City Gardens. I think he, I think he typically uh, sort of held court on Fridays um, outside of uh, Woodward's Gardens, which was uh, sort of a, a public uh, amusement park uh, in the Mission, I think bordered by uh, Mission Valencia 13th and 15th. Uh, but he had some run-ins there, which we'll we'll come to in a moment. So maybe he had to he had to change his uh, his scene uh, for a while. So here's one from uh, the 18th of October, um, 1873, on the same issue. Uh, Whereas the First National Bank refused to honor a small check of a hundred dollars to pay the value of a model for a railway switch invented by us, thereby endangering our private personal interest to a large. Uh, estate, and whereas it is publicly n notorious that one or two of the directors have large amounts in trust belonging to our private personal estate, now therefore we, nor in the first day, gratia emperor of the United States and protector of Mexico, do hereby decree the confiscation to the state of all the interests of said bank as security to the state for any losses we have or may sustain by reason of their said acts, in order that this, our said imperial decree, may be a warning to those who take upon themselves to refuse as royalty when they think it is most needed in endangering our personal health or dignity. And it, re it really is on this issue of, 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 of sort of fronts to his dignity uh, and, and, and the money issue. I mean, you know, the, the, these, are the, these are the sort of two places, and you, and you see these proclamations where uh, the, 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 the sort of the less publicly, publicly minded ones, where you get the sense that he never did quite get over the fact of his poverty. It is, it is, a, it is an abiding concern for him, and, and, uh, and, and this is a place where, where you sense that he's not quite, not quite with us when, <laughs> when, he's, when he's saying that the state is, is holding millions in trust that, uh, that belongs to him. But, uh, but the backstory on this one uh, is that he actually had asked uh, Andrew Hallady, who was in the process of being the father of the, of the, of the cable car, uh, to, to build this model. And Hallity said, sure, I'll build it for 100 bucks. So Hallity wanted to squeeze the emperor for $100. And, and this is why the emperor's got to go to the bank to get the $100 out, because he needs to pay, to pay Hallity if he's going to get the model made. Um, so, um, so here's one uh, from 20th of September, 1873. Uh, whereas we are informed that the screw which works the Clay Street Railroad, that's Halliday's Railroad, uh, is not strong enough for that purpose, and that it is consequently dangerous to the lives of passengers. Also that the dummy is a useless appendage, and now therefore the directors of the company are hereby ordered to see that precautions are taken to make travel on said railroad perfectly safe by using a screw with at least 24 inches diameter. So we know about this backstory of, of, of the emperor and Halliday. You can imagine he's, he's taking a little bit of pleasure in writing this proclamation saying that Halliday's idea is not quite fully baked yet. So, uh, so it's kind of fun. Yes, Clay Street, Clay, the Clay Street Railroad, which is sort of the first, the first, uh, first of Halliday's uh, experiments. Uh, in Clay Street, um, San Francisco. <laughs> um, here's one uh, uh, 
let's see, from uh, 21st December 1872. Whereas the destruction of horses in Europe by the Franco-Prussian War and now again by the epizootic disease in North America is a worldwide calamity in the loss of so many useful animals now. Therefore, we, Norton the First Day, Gratia Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, do hereby offer a suitable reward for the best mode of treatment to prevent the introduction or spreading of the disease on the Pacific coast. Again, a very, a very publicly minded uh, gentleman. Here is uh, one from the 23rd of August, 1873. Um, Whereas the old International Hotel and other obstructions continue to retard the progress of New Montgomery Avenue, thereby causing great damage to individuals in the city, now therefore we, nor in the first day, Gratia Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, do hereby command the commissioners to settle with the rightful owners of the obstructions uh, and have the work push forward rapidly. And I believe that, uh, that New Montgomery Avenue is not the same as New Montgomery Street. I believe New Montgomery Avenue is what became uh, Columbus Avenue. And, and so that, that's when that street was being, was being uh, laid. And he wants them to be done quickly. Here is one uh, from the 1st of November, 1873. This, is, this seems very, uh, very progressive for his time. Uh, in order to arrange the controversy, existing among the citizens regarding the fruit and vegetable market. Uh, and as, in our opinion, the street where it is at present located uh, is too narrow and altogether unsuited to the wants of the city of San Francisco, now therefore we, Norton I, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, do hereby decree that the block bounded by Merchant and Clay, Santon and Battery Streets be converted into an open square to be used as a stand for market wagons uh, and we further decree that the Board of Supervisors make an appraisement of the property condemned and award such damages to the owners as may be just and proper. So, farmer's market, you know, 1873. He's, he's out there. He's out there. Uh, here's one uh, from um, 16 May 1874. So long as Congress exacts an import duty on brandies, etc., and demands a tax for the manufacture of whiskey, no local net can prevent the sale, their license being paid. It may, however, be good judgment in Congress to repeal their act. The sale and manufacture of wines and beer is beneficial and should not be interfered with. Interesting, because Emperor Norton himself uh, was known to be... Um, not exact, not a teetotaler, but something less than a social drinker. He didn't really, didn't really drink a lot. I mean, he would, he would go to these, you know, these free lunch counters along Montgomery Street where, where you would be offered uh, a spread of, you know, salmon and roast beef and vegetables and crackers and cheese and all this, all these wonders for the price of a drink. Um, you know, typically uh, he would either just be waved through because it was just good for business to have him there uh, or someone else would, would, you know, pay for his drink, uh, uh, but uh, but usually he wouldn't uh, do much drinking himself. So let's see. Here's an, here's another on the same subject from uh, 25th of July, 1874. Whereas the sanitary the sanitary condition of the people of these United States and Mexico will be improved and life saved by a total abstinence from the use of ardent spirits as a beverage, and except only for medical purposes. Therefore, we Norton the first emperor of these United States and Mexico decree as follows, that from and after 12 months from date, it shall be unlawful to manufacture, import, or sell any ardent spirits uh, within the limits of the United States or Mexico, except for medicinal purposes, as here and before designated and allowed. This act shall not be so construed as to interfere with the use of malt liquors for the working man, and, quote, wine for the stomach's sake. So it seems like he's talking about uh, hard liquor there for the most part. Uh, here's one from 7th of February, 1874, on the issue of guns. Um, the emperor commands that the laws prohibiting the carrying of concealed weapons be strictly enforced and see if the attempts at taking life cannot be stopped. That seems timely. Uh, here is one from 26 December 1874. The public having been very indulgent in the matter of the murders committed by women, uh, they must now make take warning 
that crime of that nature must be stopped at all hazards. Interesting. Well, I guess uh, it means that uh, it wasn't just men doing the killing. But I don't know what the background is. I don't know if there was some particular problem at that time with women shooting people. Uh, I, don't know what, I don't know what the backdrop is. Uh, yeah. Here's one. Um, there was an incident uh, in 1873 where uh, someone named Matt Tarpey, uh, who had, had come into disagreement with a guy named Nicholson, and uh, in the course of, of, of a certain disagreement, um, uh, Tarpey pulls a gun and, and, uh, and manages to sort of shoot Nicholson's wife. And there's competing stories as to whether the shooting of his wife was intentional or not, uh, but the upshot was that he uh, was taken to, uh, to a jail and then he was lynched. And he, the emperor writes, whereas the lynching of Tarpey near Salinas, Monterey County on Saturday lasts as a total contempt and disrespect to the, to the majesty of the law, and whereas we're determined to bring the nation out of all such heresies, now therefore we, Norton, the first day, gratia emperor of the United States and protector of Mexico, do hereby command the arrest and trial for murder of every one of the parties implicated in said transaction, and thereby have the laws enforced." Uh, here is one from uh, the 5th of September, 1874. He's talking about sex. Whereas we are informed that 82 and one half percent of the infant population of these United States are lost or destroyed before and after birth, superinduced by Ward Beecherism, Victoria Woodhullism, and licentiousness in high places whereby this nation has become demoralized and degenerated, and now therefore we, Norton the First Dei Gratia, Emperor U.S., and Protector of Mexico, do hereby command all such persons to desist from their evil practices, as it is our firm determination to stave off divine vengeance, even by fire and sword, if necessary. So Victoria Woodhull, do, do you... Do you know the story of Victoria Woodhull? She, uh, she was someone who at the time was, uh, was very much a, uh, a woman's uh, suffragist, was, was involved in, in politics, uh, and was a particular advocate of, of, of what was called free love. And, and, and the idea was that you had the right to be happy in your marriage. And if you weren't, and you were a woman, you ought to be able to divorce, just as the, as the guy should. So that was, that, was, uh, that was her belief. So this seems uh, to be an index of, of, of a place sort of where where on sexual politics, maybe the emperor's uh, views lagged a bit. He wasn't. He wasn't. He, he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't quite there. Although you know, there there is. Um, in fact, there was a there was a there was a story about how uh, there was some women's uh, suffrage meeting where he shows up uh, and, and either is invited or just simply takes the the imperial prerogative to address the crowd, and uh, and he takes to the stage and, and says, you know, that a woman's place is in the kitchen and <laughs> that's, where, that's where she should be. Uh, at the same time, there was a petition uh, to the California Constitutional, Constitutional Convention uh, in the late 1870s, I believe, uh, and there was a petition uh, for basically uh, guaranteeing women the right to vote. Uh, and I've, I've not yet seen the document, but there are many stories about how he actually signed this, uh, this document. So it seems like his record was a little mixed. Uh, here's one from um, 16th March, 1872. Uh, this goes to the, the Woodward's Gardens uh, controversy. Uh, the headline is, Let the Emperor Have Skates or Close Up the Rinks. Uh, that probably was written by an editor, not by uh, by Emperor Norton. But the but the the uh, the proclamation itself seems to be uh, his. It says, "Whereas the prescriptive treason against our person, rights, and privileges crops out occasionally, and has lately shown itself at Wilbur's Gardens, the superintendent of the skating rink having refused us the use of skates when we wish to amuse ourselves in that way." And whereas great aches from little toe corns grow, and to prevent other acts of a like disloyal nature as now spoken of, we do hereby command the arrest of the aforesaid superintendent if he perpetuates the offense the second time. So 
He wanted to roller skate. I mean, it's, why not? You know, just, but, uh, but apparently the, the superintendent did not agree. So uh, 20th of April, 1871, here's one about the Opera House. Considering uh, that the opera tends to elevate and refine the public taste, and whereas Bianchi's opera buffet are reported to be likely to cave in for one of proper support, now therefore we, Norton the I, Dei Gratia, do hereby command all our friends and adherents to do all they can to prevent the opera from being abandoned. So, funding of the arts. There he is. Uh, here's one from uh, the 8th of June, 1872. Am I, did I get the wrong one? Ah, now, now I'm here. Now I'm here, okay. Thank you. Um, uh, whereas rebellious subjects take advantage of the absence of our imperial guard and occasionally have the audacity to refuse us admittance to the theaters, now therefore we, Norton I, Dei Gratia, Emperor, etc., do hereby command the closing of any theater, theater which may persist in insulting the dignity of our office by refusing us admittance. And again, you see the, the, the headline there, let the emperor have his royal prerogatives or close up the theaters. Seems like the same, uh, the same editor, right? Um, and and it's, it seems that he, that the theaters did uh, frequently um, reserve seats for him on opening night of their shows. Uh, it was good for business. You know, if the expectation was there that the emperor was going to be in the house, uh, that was one way to guarantee a big crowd on opening night. So, uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily just for love of the emperor, uh, but but it seems that he did he did like that, you know, and uh, maybe that was why he was calling for the opera to be uh, saved as well, because he liked to like to like to see the opera every once in a while. Here is one uh, from seventh uh, seventh February eighteen seventy four. Considering false economy on account of the expense, to exclude the teaching of French and German from the public schools and also on the score of utility, it is absolutely necessary to teach the descendants of the foreign-born people the language of their parents. Therefore, we, Norton I, Dei Gratia, Emperor U.S., and Protector of Mexico, do hereby command the Board of Education to rescind their order excluding such a lesson from the school instructions. That's good. Uh, here is one... Uh, to show uh, how even the smallest of things did not escape his notice. Uh, 4th January 1873, uh, understanding that there is a lady named Miss Watson living over at Oakland who is being annoyed by the friends of other ladies making her play hide and seek to the danger of her liberty and rights. Now, therefore, we, Norton the first day, gratia, do hereby command all and every person to desist from such outrage and wrong under penalty of our sovereign displeasure. So Miss Watson had a friend in the emperor, a good friend to have. Here's one, uh, we're coming close to the end now, uh, from uh, 16th August 1873, uh, whereas we are informed that about 200 families have become uh, for the present destitute by the fire of Portland, Oregon. The emperor does not command but appeals to the generosity of all the churches over the Pacific coast to come forward and give their might for their relief. Here is one uh, from the 27th of February, 1873, 75, I'm sorry, 1875. Uh, this is one of, the, one of the, the last ones that he wrote for the Pacific Appeal. Um, whereas we have now been over 22 years emperor of the United States, and whereas the United States has never paid us for our services as emperor of said states, during all this long period having depended solely on friends outside and in, and finding also that the state of California, through her representative offices, have collected a large sum on our account and fraudulently withheld the said sum from us, the general government is warned that the nation is held responsible and commanded to see that they are not defrauded by corrupt officials out of this money. Uh, this is interesting. Um, if you do the math, you know, the emperor declares himself um, uh, September 17th, or at least publicly declares himself, uh, September 17th, 1859. Uh, that's when that, that original proclamation sort of runs in the, in the evening bulletin. Uh, but here he is in February 1875 uh, saying, uh, we've now been uh, over 22 years emperor. So you do that math and it gets you to somewhere like in 18, late 1852. Which, which actually turns out to be exactly the time when 
the rice deal that went south started heading in that direction. So it seems that at least in his own mind, uh, he was emperor from then. Uh, and, and, and he was only uh, biding his time for a few years before letting everyone know that in fact they had had an emperor all these you know, seven years. There's another one in 1869 uh, where he does uh, similar uh, math that gets you to that same place, 1852 as being sort of where, where in his own mind his, his reign uh, begins. Here's the last one, uh, 20th June, 1874. Uh, all good people are hereby commanded to turn on procession, turn in procession and make the most of the ensuing 4th of July. The emperor acknowledges all the rights, etc., etc., and only holds and demands the authority to blend the government into a better and purer constitution, which object being accomplished, he desires the acceptance of his resignation. So what, what I read him saying here is, uh, when and if he's able to sort of blend the, uh, the, uh, the government into a better and purer constitution, then he will resign. He doesn't expect that to happen anytime soon. He's, he's, this, is, this is basically a very elegant way of affirming uh, that he expects, expects to be around for a little while longer uh, and, and that the need for an emperor is still as strong as it ever was. Um, and it's not, it's, but it's not long after that last one, 1875, that the relationship between him and the Pacific Appeal uh, goes uh, sideways. There was, a, there was a real estate developer in the South Bay. Uh, his name is, his na his name is um, Peters. I'm blanking on his first name right now, but his name is Peters. And um, he had a real estate scheme. And, and um, in a certain uh, paper in May 1875, there are three proclamations signed by Emperor Norton uh, on the front page, which is where they always were. But you go to page three or four, and there's this extra proclamation, unsigned, in a similar whereas, 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 resolved, et cetera, uh, taking aim at this Peters uh, for the fraud that he is perpetrating uh, on the good people of, uh, of the South Bay. Well, Peters doesn't like this, and so he comes to the editor of the, of the, uh, of the Pacific Appeal, Peter Anderson, and says, you know, you got to do something about this guy, and and uh, and and if you don't, uh, you're going to get sued. Uh, so so, and it, but it's not clear 100 percent that that was the emperor's proclamation. Although it seems like the sort of thing he might have written. Um, it seems that at the time, the editor would see uh, the pieces of the paper that were to be printed in pieces. So he never saw the thing whole. So he, he presented a fragment, a fragment, a fragment, a fragment, which means that anybody who was a, a, a prankish typesetter setter, had the ability to go in and make some changes on press if he was of a mind to do that. Uh, but in any case, uh, it seems that, that Emperor Norton sort of became the, the fall guy out of, out of the whole thing. And, and, and after that, uh, we don't really see uh, a lot of... Uh, proclamations from him uh, until his uh, death in January of 1880. Uh, but that seems like a good place to uh, end. Uh, does anybody have any any questions? Yes. I'm curious about the rice deal. I've kind of heard about it, but not done Yeah, he um, he took some bad advice. Uh, you know, there there was a shortage on rice going on in in late 1852, and. Um, uh, Someone came to him and said, hey, there's a, there is a, a ship full of rice. It's called the Glyde, G-L-Y-D-E, uh, sitting out in the harbor, and it's yours for the taking. Uh, and, so, and so the idea was uh, that he was able to sort of buy this rice uh, at four cents a pound, which is just a ridiculously low price. But he speculated that, that, uh, that based on the shortage, that it eventually would go up to 36 cents a pound, and, and he and his business partners uh, would make a fortune. So he was going to try to corner the market on rice, um, and, uh, and there were uh, two or three other partners that sort of went in with him on this deal. Uh, and, and then within, within, of course, you know, communications uh, you know, in, in late 1852 are not what they are in 2018. And so you just, I mean, really, you know, these kind of, these kind of, uh, of uh, of, uh, of, of business gambles are, are not for the faint of heart because you don't know what's going to come in the next day. And, and in his case, uh, within a matter of days, 
ship after ship after ship after ship of rice come in. The bottom falls out of the market, and and he's just, you know, basically his his business partners bail on him, and he is is left uh, undone. Um, the the deal was for for twenty four thousand uh, dollars, and he was reported to be worth a good bit more than that. But it seems that he he had the gene of uh, of just not being able to let go. So it really was over the next over the next three or four years uh, the, the the appeals the counter appeals paying lawyers just the the way it kind of drug out that really was where he was kind of emptied out of all of his money uh, and so he he uh, declares bankruptcy in in late 1856 uh, and for the next year or two he's still doing some uh, you know some private trade commission deals there are. Um, personal business ads that you see in the papers that he's taking out. Uh, and then he just kind of becomes seen uh, less and less and less. And he is, um, he is, he is, he is uh, taking up residence in, in uh, digs that are less and less and less nice. And uh, that's just kind of how things go. Uh, I think, I think maybe, maybe, um, Maybe forty thousand was like around was like around one point two or so. It was you know it was it was not it was not small change, certainly. It was, Especially a tough yeah. Yes. Did he live well before that? He lived he lived very well. In fact, it's it's interesting. Uh, there was um, there was a hotel there was a hotel at the at the southwest corner of Bush and Sansom. Uh, called the Rosette House, R-A-S-S-E-T-T-E. -S -S -E -T -T -E. And it was written up uh, in the journals and the papers of the day as being one of the finest first-class hotels in the city. Uh, and that's where he was living when he was at his sort of highest moment. So um, there is, um, so in, in late 1852, um, uh, you know, the, the rice sale happens. And then in June of 1853, uh, the hotel um, burns down. Uh, but because of his financial straits, you know, he's not able to get it into that kind of a place again. But then um, in 1861, 1862, what happens is that the Rosette House, uh, the first one, is rebuilt very quickly. There, so there's a, there's, a, there's a new Rosette House uh, in, in the fall of 1853. Uh, and then in, the, in sometime in like 1850. Seven or eight, I think, uh, the Rosette House goes under new management, uh, gets, gets renamed the Metropolitan Hotel. And so in 1861-62, that hotel, which was once one of the finest hotels in the city, has sort of gone to seed. Well, you know, so is the emperor. And so he actually comes back and stays on that same corner in that same building, or at least the, you know, the, new, the new version of the, of the old, the old uh, first-class hotel, uh, just kind of a different uh, time in his life. Anybody else? You talk a lot about a better and pure constitution. Do we ever expand that? Um, there, there are there are some longer statements uh, in the, at the very beginning of his of his of his reign where he kind of talks about about how how he he thinks that that the constitution is not written in such a way as to sort of, as, as to sort of prevent the kinds of, of fraud and corruption that he goes on to talk about in these in these sort of smaller. Uh, sort of proclamations. There was a, there was a, um, there was actually an address that he was to give because in that in that first proclamation he calls on everybody to to gather at this at this uh, musical hall the next February. We're going to work this out. We're going to create this empire. You know, uh, in, in a few months' time. Well, musical hall uh, burns down as things had a way of doing uh, at that at that time, and and a new a new date and time was rescheduled. Uh, the papers made hay about it. Of course, no one came, uh, but the bulletin, the bulletin actually did print the address that he would have given, uh, like a big, a big, long, you know, two long uh, columns of the whole address where he sort of spelled it out in great uh, detail. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, you've obviously done a lot of digging here, uh, and just out of what you Yeah, this this is this is actually uh, this is is research for for a book that we are working on. Uh, we have we have a small uh, sort of seed grant from the uh, SF History Association uh, to do a, a book of of selected proclamations. I think the idea is not to try to put all 400 proclamations in a book, but but to try to 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 
to produce a you know a, a printed uh, document that will actually sort of show how they appeared as as you see them here, uh, and and give a, a sort of a um, a sense of the of the full sort of range of his concerns. So so that's a project that is uh, ongoing, looking for a deal. <laughs> as far as we know. As far as we know, there 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 are um, there are um, about fifteen sixteen people uh, who uh, we the campaign have been in touch with over the last uh, four years who are um, great 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 nieces and nephews who are sort of descendants descendants of his siblings. Uh, but it seems that he was never married, uh, never had any kids. Uh, the only the only real record that we have of of any um, you can't even really call them romantic uh, inclinations. But there was a he had a there was a moment in in the 1870s where he felt like you know an emperor really should have an empress. So there was a, he was 50 at the time. There, there was a young woman in Oakland uh, uh, who um, her name was Minnie Wakeman. She was the daughter of a very prominent uh, uh, sort of military uh, general, and uh, and she was a sort of a storied uh, beauty uh, of the time, young woman, uh, accomplished at high school, and, and all that. And so he writes to her, asking for her permission to allow her name to be used as his emperor, as his empress, ma making it clear to her in very elegant language, I'm not asking you to be my wife. Uh, you know, you and I both know what those responsibilities are, and, and I'm not asking you to do that, but I would be so honored if I could just use your name because it would just be a very nice thing. And she writes him back and says, you know, such a great honor, but, you know, I just I have to decline. Uh, and those letters actually are at the Bancroft um, Library in Oakland. In Berkeley, sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't. I haven't come across anything that he that he really had any any aspirations in that direction. It seems like the proclamation was kind of his main his main vehicle of communication. He was a a, a very regular uh, attendee of uh, political meetings, uh, political debates. Uh, he was a very regular presence at those, and and there are. Uh, you, you see newspaper accounts where uh, often, as a matter of humor, an editor will will note that the emperor, you know, chimed in and said this or that or the other, you know, some interjection. Uh, but but as far as as far as being a a, a political organizer or a community organizer in, in the current uh, parlance, it doesn't seem that that was his that was his thing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and 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 talking to whoever would talk to him, and uh, I mean, by 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 all contemporaneous accounts, he was actually very uh, very fluent on the issues of the day, very well spoken. Uh, you can tell he's a great writer. Uh, you know, he he had command of the language. Uh, it, it it really was only uh, on this issue of you know, am I actually the emperor, and am I to be accorded this respect? That's where things went a little sideways. But on the issues of the day, uh, and as a conversationalist, apparently he was he was quite engaging, and 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 obviously had a lot of opinions he was willing to share. I, I think that's the assumption. I mean, you you, you had you you get you get phrases in, in the papers of the day like you know, he's he is a holding court, <laughs> you know this sort of thing, but there just there just are not any concrete accounts that survive of exactly what might have happened. It was the same thing, uh, you know, in, in the mornings. Uh, part of his routine was you know, after read the papers, he would go to Portsmouth Square, uh, and 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 apparently there were uh, there were people there who. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, had fallen on similarly hard times, uh, and who he knew, and who they, and they respected his uh, opinions, and 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 commiserated over you know their current state. Uh, you know, but uh, but there's not there's not a lot of concrete accounts of, of exactly you know what that what might have been said or what words might have been exchanged. Uh, just simply the fact that he that he you know. Uh, 
made himself available at these places, uh, whether it be at uh, at uh, Wilbur's Gardens or City Gardens, or I mean, he did he did know where the people were going to be. He, he did know sort of where uh, it's like the you know you had the you had the tradition of the, of the promenade. You know, so you know, four o'clock or so in the after, in the afternoon, Montgomery Street, everyone got out and walked up and down. And he was a regular he was a regular uh, uh, sort of attendee of of the promenade, and that's sort of where he where he got known by a lot of people because he was a very picturesque, you know, striking uh, figure. And, and, and one has to imagine that he was probably frequently stopped and, and asked for his opinion on whatever the current issues of the day were. Mm, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, I, I I resist the temptation to comment. <laughs> I mean, just you know, since we're a nonprofit and we're supposed to be sort of publicly, uh, you know, uh, do-gooders and all that, you know, we, we try to kind of keep out of the, the political fray. But it is it's certainly, uh, you know, you can't you can't look at Twitter without seeing you know everybody uh, who knows anything about the emperor at all making these connections and 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 so and so the you know the metaphor is there to be taken up you know the emperor has no clothes and all that stuff you know so uh, no I, I think I think that is I, I think it, it it certainly represents an opportunity uh, for people to sort of learn about the emperor and sort of what he was uh, about um, you know so so that's that's a that's a good thing yes Not a whole whole lot known about that, but he but he did he did spend uh, most of his uh, early life uh, in South Africa. Of course, he was born in Cape Town. Born in England, actually. He born he, in England. he was he he eventually was in Cape Town. He he I think he he started out uh, maybe uh, closer to Grahamstown, which is a little further to the to the east, but ended up in Cape Town. Uh, was in business with his father, and interestingly, apparently, was not a very good businessman. Uh, in South Africa, so it's, it's you know it's interesting that he. This was important, I think, because he was part of the uh, the Cape. Uh, I forget the term they use, the the Cape, the English Cape Colony of 1820. Right, that's right. Which was a, a pioneer general English settlement of South Africa. Right. And played an important role in the whole history of South Africa. He re, he re, he represented and hit his the other people in that group. Uh, a very important group there, right? And uh, his there may have been some important formative influences on him, right? From that period, yeah. No, I, I think I think that that is that is one of the biggest opportunities of research actually in his in his early life, and 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 that those, those archives are there. I mean, there are archives in South Africa, but they're not easy to get to. Uh, sort of getting getting the, the rights and the access to to actually read those things is, is not is not easy to do, uh, but but there is there is some some things that are known and and uh, apparently his relationship with his family wasn't great. Uh, I think I think things were a bit strained. Uh, he doesn't he didn't necessarily uh, he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't a very good Jew, uh, and 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 that was not okay with his dad and and uh, and so that that caused some some problems and 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 there there are some letters. Uh, from the mid 1840s, when his own father is starting to kind of go under uh, and go bankrupt, uh, sort of talking about his feelings about that. So, um, but yeah, it's 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 uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of blanks in, in that part of his life from from the time he's uh, two years old to the time he's um, thirty some. Yes. <laughs> no diaries. Not not that have come to light. So. Not that they're not there, but you know. Anybody? So I'm just trying to get a sense. <clears throat> how was he? I mean, how were these perceived? I mean, was he taken seriously, or was he taken as sort of a? a, a I think people use the word idiosyncratic at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think I think by that class not taken very seriously, and and by the media in general not taken very seriously. Um.
Yeah, it's it's interesting that you ha that you have that you have um, at the end of his life uh, in 1880, you have a, a reported uh, 10,000 people uh, coming to sort of see his body sort of lying in state. Uh, many there, no doubt, just out of pure fascination, uh, but others, by contemporaneous accounts, genuinely fond, genuinely sad, leaving flowers, having stories to tell, all of that. Uh, you know, he's so he's someone who. Uh, died basically a pauper uh, and would have had a pauper's um, funeral and burial uh, but for the generosity of uh, people who uh, knew him when, uh, who were, some of them were his Masonic brothers, uh, who took up a collection and, and made sure that he had a proper burial in the Masonic cemetery uh, and rather than a pauper's box, he had a rosewood and silver trim casket. Uh, so, and, and the leader of that effort uh, was a guy named Joseph Eastland, who was um, uh, a co-founder and officer of uh, the company that sort of went on to be uh, the core of the future PG&E. Uh, so, so he was known by some very prominent people, uh, and, and you had all these, these, these affectionate uh, sort of tributes sort of being given to him. Um, and of course, he had access uh, to the Mechanics Institute, uh, the Bohemian Club, um, you know, all of the, all these places, uh, you know, which were basically, you know, they would have been white male places, you know, by and large. And so I think there's, there's a real question in my mind of, of, you know, how, how, how many people were actually reading these proclamations in real time? How many, how many of those white men were, were reading an African-American owned and operated abolitionist weekly? Maybe some were, but maybe not many, and and, and that and that may be, may go some way toward explaining why uh, the myth that got created around him in the 20s and 30s and 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 going deep into the 20th century uh, didn't really include a lot of this stuff. So so I so I think there is there is a bit of a there is a bit of a course correction going on. I think it needs to go on, but I think I think there there is a sense in which in which the fondness in which he's held is you know it amounts to a kind of He's sort of aestheticized, you know. He's he's picked up for his personal style and 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 just the the fact of his, just his pure survival, uh, you know. And of course, the photographs go a long way towards advancing that that myth. Uh, but but how much people actually sort of engage with what he actually was trying to say uh, at the time, uh, you know, political meetings maybe, but not not the proclamations perhaps. Yeah, it's interesting that the, the the account that appears in, in the SF Chronicle on the 11th of uh, January 1880, uh, this is the one that that is headed up by the by the headline "Le Roi est mort," you know, the king is dead, you know, which most people most people think that that actually appeared in the, in the SF Chronicle the next day. It actually appeared uh, in the article that was covering his funeral and burial uh, proceedings, uh, and and that reporter, uh, uncredited, sir, talks about how. Uh, you know, yeah, there are these 10,000 people estimated who showed up uh, on O'Farrell Street uh, to look at his body at the morgue, uh, but there were only two or three carriages that that actually made the way to the, the way to the Masonic Cemetery. So you had this this apocryphal tale about how you know the, the two mile long cortege and the entire city was in mourning and all of that, you know, but um, but according to the newspaper account. There was only a couple of carriages, and once you actually got to the cemetery, about 30 people. So, which is, so it's it's interesting to to try to sort of think about you know what were what were the what were all the different motivations and reasons why you know those 10,000 people sort of showed up. So was that in Colma or in the city? That was in the city. That was in the city. He wasn't moved to Colma until 1934. Uh, but it's interesting that it was that it was uh, it was sort of the same crowd because it was in, in 1880 it was the members of the Pacific Club uh, who had taken up the 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 fund for his uh, burial and casket and all of that and then in 1934 which actually was coming toward the end of this kind of early 20th century uh, sort of cemetery uh, eviction uh, um, you know, it was the Pacific uh, Union Club. At that point, the Pacific and the Union Club had been separate clubs. They had merged many years ago. Uh, you know, a few of them came together in an ad hoc way, uh, not officially, but in an ad hoc way, and said, hey, we should take care of this. 
Uh, and there's actually, a, there's actually a document, there's actually a piece of paper at the California Historical Society that has the, the whole sort of record of receipts and disbursements from 1934, so you can see exactly like who gave and how much. Uh, and that beautiful stone, that rose uh, granite stone in Colma that's at his grave now, in 1934, $74.40. Interesting. At Woodlawn. Oh, no, this is the one at Woodlawn. The one at Woodlawn. But, but in Coma, apparently, there, uh, sorry, in, in, in the Masonic, you know, here in, here in the city, uh, there, there, was, there, was no, uh, there was no marker at the time. There are stories that there was, a, there was a, some thought of, of, of trying to sort of take up a collection to do one. Uh, but the collection uh, was, uh, if it was taken up, was by the Episcopal Church, which, you know, that goes to the whole larger issue of, you know, where was the Jewish community, you know, during that time. That's a whole separate... Uh... I would describe, would you describe him as, uh, uh, for example, uh, Jewish Orthodox Christian Orthodox Christian Orthodox Christian Orthodox Christian Orthodox Christian Orthodox Christian I think that's, I think that's fair. Yeah, I mean, someone like James Lick, for example, who you know had millions of dollars and 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 was was uh, very eccentric indeed. It's, it's hard to know though because it, it you know whether whether the, the loss of his money actually if there was actually a cause and effect. I mean, I I, I don't know uh, that that he was known uh, necessarily uh, you know that much uh, in 1849, 50, 51, 52 of having this very sort of socially progressive uh, mission. However, there is, uh, you know, he was a member of the first, um, the first Vigilance Committee uh, in 1851. And the, the one uh, contribution that he made uh, that is recorded is his insistence uh, on habeas corpus. So, so maybe, maybe, that, maybe there is something there that he, that he was someone who, who had, a, had a real feel for fairness uh, from an early, from early time. Have you uh, had any uh, contact from him in any way through these uh, mystical things, that, like little messages? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I have heard of those who, who have claimed uh, such, uh, such uh, visitations. Um, but uh, I'll keep my eyes open and my ears. Yeah, I mean Twain. Twain did. I mean Mark Twain did a little bit. Uh, you know, he would. You know, it was, you know, there was a sense in which, uh, for a writer like him, of course, who was who was basically sort of writing in a, in a comic uh, vein, it was almost sort of de rigueur to mention Emperor Norton or sort of throw in a line about the Emperor for some humorous effect. Uh, but he actually wrote to his editor uh, after Emperor Norton died, and uh, with a with a a real strong note of, of regret uh, that neither he nor Bret Hart nor any of any of their sort of high-level contemporaries really uh, made it their business to, uh, you know, what Twain calls sort of write him up and write the emperor up, really do a proper profile of him that would really sort of get it at uh, sort of what he was about. But jump cartoon shows him, at least Yeah, there there is actually one. There's a lithograph of one of the jump cartoons that is in the that is in the. Um, that is in the, the exhibit in the SF History Center on the sixth floor. So if you, if you go there, there's a there's a one of the ones that has has him and and uh, George Washington the second and other figures of the time and Bummer Bummer Ladgers all hanging out on the street. So, uh, but there is one like that too, right? And and the one people usually talk about is is the one uh, called the Three Bummers, where he is portrayed uh, sort of at a, at a lunch counter. Uh, with the two dogs, and of course the implication is that he's a bummer too, uh, and he apparently didn't like that very much. So, I think I'm getting the I'm getting the clock. Does anybody? Are, are we Are we Five done? We, we need to be done. We need to be done. We We are done. <laughs> I just have a question. Did he make his own currency? I mean, 
he, he, had, he had them printed. Uh, from, from, from 1870 to uh, 1875, it was the same printer, uh, uh, the, pr the printer for the Pacific Appeal, a printer called Cuddy and Hughes, uh, also printed uh, the Emperor's Notes. And so they sort of struck up that relationship. And it seemed like after, after, uh, after the relationship with the Pacific Appeal ended, uh, you know, then he struck up a new friendship with another fine printer named Charles Murdoch, uh, someone he met uh, at the Unitarian Church, who printed his notes from 1878 until his death. So. Yeah, there, there, there are quite a few of these notes around, and, and um, many of them are, are, in, are in museums and, and, and libraries. Uh, some are in private hands. If they ever do happen to come on the market, you're talking, you know, six, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000. They do. There, there's, there's one at the Wells Fargo Museum on Montgomery Street that is always on display as part of the permanent collection. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. This is great. A lot of fun. Uh, you, can, you can get uh, one of our cards uh, is, is on the table there that has our, our website. We are a membership organization. We'd love to have you join and support our work. Uh, we call our, our members Emissaries of the Empire. So if you want to be an Emissary of the Empire, you can uh, give us your cash. Thanks a lot. Hey, thank you.